tonight on Unsolved Mysteries. The legend of Bugsy Siegel. Handsome, sexy, a cold-blooded killer. But one night in Beverly Hills, the Mafia's hunter became the hunted. In Southern California, rain-slick roads lead to a brush with death. In New Jersey, another accident terrifying and nearly fatal. Soon after, both drivers claimed they could predict the future. Can a car crash make you suddenly psychic? For Marlis Thomas, it should have been the happiest day of her life. The doctors dropped a bombshell. Her seemingly healthy baby had died. Today, a series of baffling contradictions has led Marlis to believe the impossible. Her daughter may still be alive. For generations, the streets of Queens, New York have seen aspiring gangsters come and go. But according to the FBI, Pauli Ragusa is one of a kind, a would-be wise guy, intent on making a name for himself by whatever means possible. Join me as we try to help authorities and the families of crime victims bring closure to unsolved mysteries. Mobsters in the 1940s. Life in New York, Chicago, and Los Angeles was brutal. Mafia bosses took pride in killing and getting away with it. But there is one famous hit for which no one has ever taken credit. The murder of Bugsy Siegel. In the late evening of June 20th, 1947, Siegel relaxed in the Beverly Hills home of his girlfriend. The mob's top assassin had no idea that he was a target. Nine shots were fired into the room. Four found their mark. Bugsy Siegel died instantly. The list of suspects read like a classic whodunit. Business associates, a girlfriend, even a bodyguard. But police investigating Siegel's murder hit the wall of the Mafia's code of silence, a wall that still exists today. The main frustration that I have in the case is all my witnesses are either gone or still won't talk. So the frustration is, is that I'm running out of time if I haven't lost that time already, and I'm just still not getting any information. For Beverly Hills Police, the murder of Bugsy Siegel is still an open case. But with each passing year, the chances of solving the glamour city's most notorious crime become slimmer. Tonight, the suspect list is in your hands. Can you figure out who killed Bugsy Siegel? His real name was Benjamin Siegel. He was a mob's most feared hitman. Beneath the smile of the handsome New Yorker was the heart of a cold-blooded killer. Siegel's violent temper was legendary. Underworld figures talked for years about how he took revenge after being injured in a bomb blast. He sneaked out of the hospital at 2 a.m., got into a car with his associates, drove to the home of the suspect in Brooklyn. When the door was answered, bang, 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 they shot him. And back in the car, sneaked him back into the hospital. He had a perfect alibi. Siegel formed a partnership with Meyer Lansky in New York, an organized crime syndicate that sold liquor during Prohibition, then worked its way into gambling, prostitution, 
and murder for hire. Ben Siegel and Maya Lansky were a great combination. They complemented each other. Lansky did the thinking. It was Bugsy who did the whacking. In the early 40s, Siegel and Lansky teamed up with another East Coast Mafia boss, Lucky Luciano. When the team of Siegel, Lansky, and Luciano decided to expand their territory, it was the beginning of the end for Bugsy. He was sent to take control of gambling in California. There he faced a major problem. Suspect number one, Jack Dragna. And there ain't no one gonna stand in my way. Right, Jack? They'd be stupid. Dragna controlled a lucrative wire service used by bookies across the country. Bugsy made a simple proposal. Give up the wire or give up your life. Dragna chose to live, which gave him two motives to kill Bugsy Siegel. Jealousy and revenge. After Bugsy died, Jack Dragna got his wire service back. Bugsy ran the mob's business in Tinseltown with the showmanship of a Hollywood superstar. He began an affair with suspect number two, Virginia Hill, an alleged cash courier for the mob. But Hill may have had her own reasons for wanting Bugsy dead. She was leading a double life. Virginia Hill was definitely connected in some way with the Chicago mob. She was out there keeping an eye on Bugsy and feeding the Chicago mob information on Bugsy's activities. On the night Bugsy was killed in Virginia's home, she was out of town, by coincidence or not. In Hollywood, only one man seemed to hold his ground against Bugsy Siegel. Suspect number three, Mickey Cohen, was a Cleveland gangster newly transplanted to L.A. Siegel could have killed him, but instead he put him on his payroll. Ben liked that, that this guy stood up to him. He liked it so much that he made him his personal bodyguard. Really. After Siegel's death, Cohen was given control of West Coast Gambling, a promotion he would never have seen with Bugsy alive. When gambling became legal in Nevada, Siegel saw the opportunity of a lifetime. He envisioned a luxurious casino like the world had never seen. Bugsy figured the Flamingo would cost a million dollars. Lansky and Luciano gave him the money, but one million became two, two became four, and four became six. Lansky and Luciano became the final suspects. They needed to plug a loose cannon that was financially out of control. It has to stop, and stop now. Lansky did go out and visit Siegel in Nevada, and I think he cautioned him and he warned him Pay attention to the business. Don't let the costs get too high. Your investors are not happy. There were also rumors that Siegel was pocketing some of his investors' money to support Virginia Hill. She was a, a very, very expensive playmate. They probably had a feeling that he was spending some of their money on Virginia. 20 minutes after Siegel's death, two members of the Lansky-Luciano mob took control of the Flamingo Casino. A new boss. Mr. Siegel's no longer in the picture. If you have any questions, you can call our friends in New York. No one believed the timing of the takeover was coincidental. Investigators have little doubt that Siegel's hit was a professional job. But which of the suspects could have been involved in Bugsy's death? Some feel the most likely scenario involves them all. Virginia Hill provided the location for the murder and possibly was given a reward. She had two, three million dollars in a, in a Swiss bank account. Siegel's bodyguard, Mickey Cohen, knew his boss's schedule for the evening. But at the time of the killing, he was not doing his job. Mickey Cohen even came into the station and said, uh, what happened, what happened? I was supposed to be watching him. And Jack Dragner? He may have ordered the hit with the approval of Lansky and Luciano. 
He would not have dared to do it on his own. He would have asked permission from people he regarded in, in the New York area. Uh, it's a possibility because they were thinking of killing Siegel anyway, so all right, let Jack Dragner handle it. Today, none of the key suspects in the Siegel murder are still alive, but Beverly Hills police still hope that the Mafia code of silence may one day be broken. Murder has no statute of limitations. So until the case is solved, the case remains open. I'm sure there's people out there that are descendants of people in the Mafia, or people in the know, that uh, have information I would love to have a phone call from. Perhaps there is someone, just one person who might have that vital clue that can crack this intriguing 50-year-old case. Perhaps it's you. Next, one police officer dead and two wounded, and the suspects are still on the run. Level 11, Cortez. That truck is 1099 out of Durango. May 29, 1998. 45-year-old police officer Dale Claxton followed a stolen water truck out of the small town of Cortez, Colorado. Claxton was a relative newcomer to the force, having become an officer just three years earlier. I'll lay him behind it. Send me some backup. Air Force. Suddenly, the water truck pulled over. Dale Claxton had no idea what he was about to encounter. Dale never had a chance to unbutton his seatbelt, uh, even go for the door. It was terrible. It was, in 33 years of being in this business, it's the most violent thing I've ever seen. Dale Claxton left behind a wife, four children, and a grandchild. Look at me. Take a picture for your mother. There is no sense to this. The men who killed Dale were armed for war, and they were ready to kill whoever and whatever got in the way. An assault, a sudden attack in the foothills of the Rocky Mountains, done with brutal military-like precision. Who were these people wielding AK-47s and assault rifles? Police had no idea and the killing of Dale Claxton was only the beginning. An APB was quickly put out on the water truck. Deputy Jason Bishop was told to search for it. What he didn't know was the suspects had abandoned the water truck and had stolen a pickup. I just happened to look in my rearview mirror and I see this yellow Ford pickup following me really close. That's when the shots started coming in. Um, I lost consciousness and fell over into the passenger seat and um, wrecked my patrol car. For the next five minutes, law enforcement was under siege. State troopers and local police were moving targets in the rampage. When they came around the corner at me, it, it took me by surprise. They went off the road to go by me, and they were doing at least 60, 70. Then the yellow pickup was bearing down on Detective Sergeant Todd Martin. I was just overwhelmed with uh, automatic gunfire. My left arm exploded. Martin was hit twice, once in the arm, once in the leg. Officer Jim Bob White saw him go down. I lost so much blood. They said I, I lost the maximum amount that anybody could lose 
without getting a transfusion and keeping alive. So I think uh, if it wasn't for Jim Bob, uh, I would have died out there. Nine law enforcement vehicles have been riddled with 300 high caliber assault rounds. Police and troopers never had a chance to get off a single shot. One officer was dead and two were hospitalized. It was as if they were fighting a military battle. They were dressed military fatigues, uh, could f uh, full military gear, and uh, as if they were going to war. An hour later, the stolen pickup truck was found in a ravine 41 miles northwest of Cortez on the Colorado-Utah border. It sparked the largest manhunt in Colorado history. 62 police agencies participated. Where we found the vehicle is some of the ruggedest country in the state of Utah. Lots of Indian ruins in it, lots of mines, some deep canyons, uh, and just lots of uh, places to hide. Police identified the suspects in the shooting. 30-year-old Alan Monte Pylon from nearby Dove Creek and Durango residents Robert Mason and Jason McVean, both 26. All three were known to have anti-government views. Pylon was also battling the IRS over back taxes. Though they had no criminal records, the men once tried to join a militia group in the Four Corners area, but were thrown out for being too violent. More importantly, they all were well-trained in wilderness survival tactics. They had supplies stored throughout the area, the same hills and canyons used as a hideout a century ago by Butch Cassidy's Hole in the Wall gang. They had been going to that area for the last four or five years, had done a lot of survivalist training in that area, had done a lot of uh, backpacking and living off the land in that area. It was like them going to their backyard. A week later, the fugitives struck again. This time, they shot and wounded a deputy sheriff in Bluff, Utah. SWAT teams quickly surrounded the area. A few hours later, the body of suspect Robert Mason was discovered, dead from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Coming up, two separate car crashes seem to give the accident victims astonishing psychic powers. An evening rainstorm in Southern California. Driver John Holland's life was about to change forever. was dazed, but not seriously injured. But the following day, he started to feel strange. I started noticing uh, kind of like electricity building up in my body, like a, I don't want to say a power, but it was more like a surge of energy was building. Um, I just felt that my body had too much energy in it. That's the only way I could describe it. And then I started talking to people on the phone, uh, some friends. And as I was talking to them, I was realizing I, would, I started to know things in their lives, what was going to happen. As a child, Holland had been interested in psychic phenomena. But it wasn't until after his accident that he says he became aware of his gift. It became obvious at his job at a local hotel bar. He knew when it was a stranger's birthday. He knew that a co-worker would have complications in childbirth. Holland says he was never wrong. It would just come out of my mouth straight out, and I had to learn how to, to stop that. So it was almost like my customers was my practice. So I'm seeing three years for the two of you. Am I right? I'm picking up the number three. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that was fun. Holland became a sensation at the hotel. Business executives would come to see him to ask if a big deal was going to happen. I see the merger as being something that's, that's going to be a success. He said his predictions were so uncanny 
the co-workers became wary of him. Others felt his predictions were simply clever manipulations. Holland's boss eventually asked him to stop telling the future because he was frightening the customers. I'm not out to prove anything, okay? Um, this is what happened to me, this is what comes out of me, and this is, people come back and confirm. Car accidents and other sudden events that shake up a person's body and of course the inner body called the aura have on occasion caused that person to become psychic. There are a number of cases on record. There's also a case of a man who fell off a ladder and as a result became a well-known psychic. Something happens to the uh, inner body of the person as it were and what was before an ordinary human being now becomes a psychic. It's perfectly natural. For two years after his accident, John Holland honed his psychic skills. He began seeing clients, people who wanted to know what the future held for them. Holland claims his powers intensified and quickly reached a more profound level. He's here now, and, uh, he could communicate he with the dead. He's fine. A client named Adrian who came to see me, um, and her dad passed away, um, sadly. And basically she wanted to know uh, where is he? What, what is he doing right now? So what happened, her dad came and told me to tell her to look in a book on the bookshelf. He wants you to be at peace. He described the bookcase, he described the location of a book, and he said, and, and there's gonna be something, a message from your father in this book. And I was unclear if he meant the book. It's, and he said, no, there's a message in it, a piece of paper, a message from your father that will let you know that he's okay. It took two weeks before Adrian got the courage to open the book. Inside was a poem written by her father 28 years ago. It was called Soar into the Cosmic Blue. And it talks about f finding that there's a whole nother world to explore when you leave this world. And all that's out there is, is, is open to you then. And it ends, uh, soar into the universe of light and peace and fly to the rim of heaven. It's a baffling mystery. Can trauma spark unseen forces that allow us to see things others cannot? Do we all possess the ability to see the future? Could we too someday become suddenly psychic? In Saddle River, New Jersey, a mother and her son were badly injured in a devastating car accident caused by a drunk driver. Elizabeth Joyce had shielded her son Jeff from the impact. She suffered massive injuries in the wreck. On the way to the hospital, her heart had to be restarted three times. During the blackouts, she was reunited with relatives who had died a year earlier. On the left was my stepson, on the right was my husband. They talked to me with their mind. You have to go back, you have to go back. Okay, Mom, Mom, Doctor, Mom. Elizabeth survived the accident without any permanent physical disabilities, but she feared neurological damage. I started having a tingling sensation across my shoulders and up my neck, and I started having blackouts. Elizabeth began having a frightening, recurring dream. It was an explosion. I saw a house, I saw a body, I saw it go out the roof. I was aware of oil wells, I was aware of a trailer park and a fence. It was so real to me. And in my head, I would hear your aunt died. She's in Houston, Texas. But Elizabeth's aunt lived in Concord, New Hampshire, not Houston. After having the dream every night for three weeks, she confided to social worker Brenda Hayes. Brenda was amazed. The home Elizabeth was describing was her aunt's, and her aunt had died in an explosion a week earlier. There was a pipeline explosion on her property, and they haven't been able to find her body or find any remains to identify what happened to her. 
I started to explain to her what the setup was. And she said, no, wait, I'll draw you a picture. Elizabeth drew an exact rendition of the house. She then pointed to a section of tall grass near an oil well and said Brenda's aunt was there. Brenda called the authorities in Houston. Within an hour, police had found the body of her aunt. It would not be the last time Elizabeth's newly discovered powers would solve a mystery. In 1992, Sidney J. Riso, the president of the Exxon Corporation, was kidnapped from in front of his home. Police had few clues in the baffling crime, but Elizabeth Joyce had a vision about the abduction and called police. I really don't give much credence to psychics. I'm not a fan of psychics, and I've come across many, many psychics. But in this particular case with Elizabeth Joyce, I did find her to be very, very accurate. In black and white, I saw a blonde-haired woman in a jogging suit running behind the car, falling and screaming for help. I saw the man get out of the car to go over and help this woman. I saw a man come around from the bushes. I saw him grab this man that had gotten out of the Cadillac and put a gun to his head and force him into a white van. I knew that it was Risso. Elizabeth says she was in contact with the FBI on a daily basis for six weeks, giving them information about the case. I said, they're putting him in a trunk and they're taking him off a main road and they're going to dig a shallow grave. And he said, describe it to me. Oh, I said, it's between two pine trees. It's in a, it's in a narrow space between two pine trees and it's off a main road, either the Garden State Parkway or the New Jersey Turnpike. Though the FBI will not talk about Elizabeth's involvement, a body of Sidney Riso was found exactly where she said it would be. Sidney Riso's remains were in a three foot deep uh, sandy grave in the depths of the Pine Barrens. She says her information also helped catch the killers. For Elizabeth, the proof is in her results. I don't try to ever convince anyone that there is such a thing as psychic sensitivity. I let them find it for themselves. I'm there to help others if they are open to being helped. If I can reach one person, um, that it helps them change their life for the better, and they know uh, things about themselves more, or if they know that we all go on, then I've done my job. John Holland and Elizabeth Joyce say they are continuing to use their powers to help others. Both have day jobs and say they do psychic work on the side, charging nominal fees for their services. Can John and Elizabeth really see the future? Many believe they can, but in the unexplained world of psychic phenomena, their stories remain an unsolved mystery. Next, it was Morris Thomas's worst nightmare. Now the tragic loss of her newborn infant has become an intriguing unsolved mystery. This is Marlis Thomas. She's 55 years old and in failing health. More than 30 years ago, Marlis thought she buried her infant daughter in this graveyard. Now she believes that daughter is still alive. June 12, 1962, Worthington, Minnesota. Marlis was just 20 years old and separated from her husband. She had moved to Minnesota to be near her mother when the baby was born. Marlis was heavily sedated during her difficult labor. The next thing Marlis remembers is seeing her daughter Mary Agnes Gross for the first time. I couldn't take my eyes off of her little feet. They were moving and I felt so happy. And I just kept watching her little feet and then I drifted back to sleep. When I woke up, I looked to see where my baby was and I didn't see her. And I asked the nurse, where's my baby? And she said, the doctor will be in to talk to you. Can I see my baby now? I'm sorry, Marlis, but your baby died. How long did my baby live? Just one hour. I want to see my mother now. Oh, no, 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 relax. We'll I'm... take you to your mother soon I'm... enough. Now, just, just trust oh, it. Oh, no. 
And that was just such a shock to me, you know. It hurt so bad. And I could hardly believe that, you know, because I seen her little feet move. Is that my baby? Please. I have to see my baby. Please, no. When Morris left the delivery room, she passed a bassinet that was on its way to the morgue. And I must have only seen my daughter maybe 10 seconds, 15 at the most. And my baby didn't look dead. My baby looked like she was just sleeping. She wasn't purple. Then uh, she had dark hair and uh, she had lots of hair. Morris also noticed that Mary Agnes had marks on her forehead. Marks left by the doctor's forceps during the delivery. Morris asked for an autopsy, but was told it was too late. While Morris was still in the hospital, her friend Judy Voges visited the funeral home along with Morris' mother. Judy claims that the baby she saw looked different from the infant that Morris had described. I didn't see any marks on her forehead. Her hair was light brown, not dark brown. It was light brown, and not a whole lot of it. It was, it looked, you know, kind of downy-like, I suppose. I'm sorry. I can't allow you a photograph. Stranger still, when Marlis's mother tried to take a picture of the baby, the funeral director would not allow it. For my daughter. I know. You can take one at the cemetery after the after the casket's been closed. Later that day, Morris's mother did take these pictures of the casket just before the burial. The day was marked by an additional bizarre occurrence. Morris's mother told her that another family was at the gravesite mourning the death of a child. And they took it so hard and they prayed and prayed and they had tears. I could never figure out who those people were. My mother never could figure out who those people were. A week after the funeral, Morris was well enough to visit Mary Agnes' gravesite. There was only one grave there at that time, and I took it so hard, just so bad. And from that day on, I was out to that cemetery like three, four times a week. Morris accepted her baby's death as a natural occurrence. But just three months later, another unsettling development Morris received a mysterious photograph in the mail. There was no letter, no return address, just a picture of a husband, a wife, and three children, one of them a baby girl. The baby looked like my husband, and I didn't know these people. I've never seen these people in my life. And I showed it to my family, and my family didn't know who those people were either, but they also thought the baby looked a lot like my husband. Strange indeed, but it would be nearly three decades before Mollis would come to realize the significance of the picture. A year passed before Mollis saved enough money to buy a headstone, but inexplicably, Cemetery workers did not place a stone atop Mary Agnes's burial plot. Instead, it was positioned a few feet off to the side. Though she moved away, Morris periodically visited her daughter's grave. On one visit, she got the shock of her life. In 1989, a headstone for a different baby had been placed on Mary Agnes's burial plot. That baby's name was Pamela Ray Dickey. Marlis immediately questioned the funeral director. I says, well, this can't be. I says, I even bought a stone and laid it out there. And then he said right away, he said, I often wondered what that stone was doing out there because there never was a grave. And I says, well, I know they laid it on the wrong spot at that time. Well, he says, no, he says, your daughter's not buried out here. Not buried here, Morris was deeply disturbed. The old doubts and questions came flooding back. She began researching the details of her baby's supposed death and burial and discovered an odd coincidence. Pamela Dickey had died only a few hours before Morris' daughter on the same day in the same hospital. And even more startling, Mary Agnes and Pamela Dickey were also buried on the same day. 
There was not two funerals out there that day. There was only one funeral, one grave. And after the funeral, there was only one heap of dirt. That's all there was out there. There was more. Modest found Mary Agnes's last name, Gross, written in the upper corner of one of Pamela Dickey's funeral papers. Even more puzzling, hospital records said Mary Agnes was healthy at birth, but the death certificate said she had never drawn a breath. The birth certificate said she was born at 6.23 p.m. Incredibly, the death certificate said she died three minutes before she was born at 6.20. Every place that I go and check this out, the papers just, just like my daughter had never died. You know, there's no, nothing that shows me that my daughter died. Morris asked Pamela Dickey's mother for help, but understandably, Margaret Dickey preferred not to disturb her daughter's grave. Nonetheless, Morris had to make certain Mary Agnes's body had not been moved without her knowledge. She had the grave that lay beneath her daughter's tombstone exhumed. The remains were old and difficult to identify, but Morris was right. DNA testing revealed that the child buried there was not Mary Agnes Gross, nor was it Pamela Ray Dickey. Modest then showed the pictures her mother had taken of Mary Agnes's casket to Pamela's mother, Margaret Dickey. She looks at the picture, she says, that's my baby. My husband bought that casket. And then I asked her, I said, did anyone go to your baby's funeral? She said, yes, my in-laws and my husband. I believe that my mother now went to the Pamela Ray Dickey's funeral. That that's only one baby there, and that's Pamela Ray Dickey. If Morris is right, and Pamela Dickey is buried where she thought her own daughter was laid to rest, what happened to Mary Agnes? Today, Morris has only one possible explanation. She is convinced that Mary Agnes is still alive, and that the baby in the picture she received more than 30 years ago was her firstborn daughter. What I think today that picture was, was a family that adopted my baby, and they wanted to show me that my baby was in a family, and that's why they sent me that picture. I was 20 years old, I lived by myself, and maybe they thought that I couldn't take care of the baby, so they had another family raise my baby. Marta still suffers the agony of not knowing what happened to her daughter. If Mary Agnes is indeed alive, she was born in 1962 and would today be 35 years old. The birth took place at Worthington Regional Hospital in Worthington, Minnesota. I want so bad to find where my daughter is. You know, I really gotta know where, where she is and I'll never give up, never give up until I find where she's at. Next, the FBI says Pauli Ragusa did it all. Racketeering, robbery, attempted murder. Is it any wonder they want your help to track down this fugitive wise guy? New York City, the Big Apple. Money, media, and fashion. But in the shadows of the skyscrapers, another world, the underworld. Across the river from Manhattan lies the borough of Queens. For generations, these streets have been home turf for powerful mobsters and a fertile breeding ground for young wannabe wise guys like Pauli Ragusa of Ridgewood, Queens. By all accounts, Pauli was on the outside looking in. To get the attention of the important crime families, Ragusa apparently felt he had to make a statement. He made it with guns and violence. Paul Ragusa was the leader, I think, based on his propensity to engage in violence. Uh, Ragusa is known as a fighter, as somebody that is not uh, uh, adverse to using his hands and to uh, using firearms. Paulie Ragusa allegedly did it all. Robbery, assault, racketeering, arson. And he got away with it because his victims refused to press charges. 
For Paulie, winding up on the FBI's 10 most wanted list was probably inevitable. Some say he was literally born into a life of crime. His father, Filippo, uh, was a major heroin trafficker who smuggled in uh, many kilos of heroin from Sicily. Uh, his older sister, Francesca, was a member of um, uh, his father's heroin uh, ring. Uh, her husband was also a member of the ring, and so was uh, another of uh, Paulie's brother-in-laws. With his father behind bars, Paulie set his sights on being a big-time crime boss with his own family. He organized the Giannini Crew, a gang of aspiring mobsters who reportedly had their headquarters in the heart of Queens at the Cafe Giannini. It's a place that the, uh, the young wannabes aspired to go to uh, just to be closer to the real tough guys, the made guys. According to police, Ragusa and his gang spent countless hours sipping espresso and plotting the crimes that they hoped would put them on the map. Paul and his gang were extremely dangerous. They just didn't have any regard for life. If you got in their way, they were going to shoot you. You know, it's not a birthright. Uh, you have to be Italian uh, to get into the mob, but you have to earn your way into it. You have to show that you're a tough guy and willing to do just about uh, anything uh, that's required to make money uh, for the family. Uh, these guys, however, went too far. A perfect example. Ragusa and his Giannini crew robbed the same bank in their own neighborhood three times in a row netting more than $200,000. But for sheer audacity, nothing matched the events that took place in Maspeth, Queens. Two security officers carrying $20,000 in cash arrived at a bank to make a night deposit. The driver got out of the van, proceeded over to the night deposit box. As he walked over to the night deposit box, he realized there was a van across the street. He turned, and at that time, Three suspects exiting the van approached him and fired at him at rapid session. He returned fire, emptying his revolver. He then fell to the ground and crawled to safety. His partner, taking cover behind a wall, also returned fire. A wild shootout ensued. You can still see some of the results from that shootout. The shootout left one security guard seriously injured. Authorities later linked Ragusa and the Giannini crew to the robbery. Investigators believe the guards might have been executed if the gunman had not run out of ammunition. The main factor that makes these types of individuals uh, so dangerous is one, their youth, and two, their total disregard for human life. By early 1996, a joint investigation by the FBI and the New York City Police led to a 32-count indictment against Ragusa and 13 members of his gang. Ragusa did not wait around to be arrested. If you want to be a tough guy, you have to show you're uh, not afraid of anything. But deep down, all of these guys uh, have some kind of a fear that they're going to be caught. It was this knowledge that Paulie was going to get caught that uh, forced him to run away. Paulie Ragusa has been on the run since June of 1996. He reportedly speaks fluent Italian, frequents high-priced prostitutes, and is a heavy gambler. Ragusa is 27 years old stands 5 feet 10 inches tall and weighs 170 pounds. Some mysteries may never be explained, but others may be solved with a single phone call from you. Join me for our next edition of Unsolved Mysteries.